The armies that U.S. Grant and George McClellan led were the best equipped in history. The productive capacity and technical ingenuity of the North were now focused on weapons. And the Civil War would see the first railroad artillery, the first landmines and telescopic sites, the first military telegraphs. In 1862 alone, 240 patents were issued for military weapons. Lincoln was fascinated by new weaponry. He personally tested new rifles and ordered up 10 Union repeating guns, forerunners of the machine gun. But he passed up a scheme to manufacture canoe-shaped footwear for walking on water and tactfully declined a herd of war elephants offered by the King of Siam. Oh, he had many crazy ideas, uh, along with some good ones. Uh, there was one plan to use two cannon each with a cannonball, and the two cannonballs connected by a chain, and you would fire the two cannons at the same time, and the balls would go out, and the chain between them would just cut a swath through everything in the way. The trouble was one cannon, of course, went off before the other one did, with the result that the ball went around in a circle from the other cannon. The most important innovation of the whole war was the rifled musket, along with a French refinement. Captain Claude Minet's new bullet, an inch-long lead slug that expanded into the barrel's rifled grooves and spun as it left the muzzle. The mini ball could kill at half a mile and was accurate at 250 yards, five times as far as any other one-man weapon. The age of the bayonet charge had ended, though most officers did not yet know it when the war began. And some had still not learned it when the war was over. It was brutal stuff. The reason for the high casualties is really quite simple. The weapons were way ahead of the tactics. The rifle itself. It threw a 53 caliber soft lead bullet at a low muzzle velocity. And when it hit, uh, the reason there were so many amputations, if you got hit here, it didn't clip your bone the way the modern steel jacket did bullet does. You didn't have any bone from here to here. They had no choice but to take the arm off. And you'll see pictures of the dead on the battlefield with their clothes in disarray as if someone had been going rifling their bodies. That was the men themselves tearing their clothes up to see where the wound was. And they knew perfectly well if they were gut shot, they'd die. April 25th, 1862. Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee. Dear Julia, I'm no longer boss. General Halleck is here and I'm truly glad of it. I hope the papers will let me alone in the future. If the papers only knew how little ambition I have outside of putting down this rebellion and getting back once more to live quietly and unobtrusively with my family, I think they would say fewer falsehoods. Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant's reward for the costly Union victory at Shiloh was to be removed from field command. Grant's superior was General Henry Wager Halleck, a calculating administrator who was jealous of Grant's success and anxious to get rid of his chief rival. After the Battle of Fort Donelson, he spread rumors Grant was drinking. After the fearful losses at Shiloh, he had Grant reassigned. Grant decided to quit, but his friend William Tecumseh Sherman talked him out of it. You could not be quiet at home for a week, he said, when armies are moving. Grant and Sherman were both Ohio boys and West Pointers who were fond of cigars, scorned pomp and politics, and had fared poorly in civilian life. Grant enjoyed Sherman's rapid fire brilliance and was grateful for the dispatch with which he carried out every order. Sherman admired his friend's cool temper, his steadiness in the midst of crisis, and what he called Grant's simple faith in success. They trusted each other. I'm a damned sight smarter than Grant. 
I know more about organizations, supply and administration, and about everything else than he does. But I'll tell you where he beats me and where he beats the world. He don't care a damn for what the enemy does out of his sight. But it scares me like hell. William Tecumseh Sherman. Any attempt now to separate the freedom of the slave from the victory of the government, any attempt to secure peace to the whites while leaving the blacks in chains, will be labor lost. The American people and the government at Washington may refuse to recognize it for a time, but the inexorable logic of events will force it upon them in the end that the war now being waged in this land is a war for and against slavery. Frederick Douglass. Letter by letter, speech by speech, month after month, Frederick Douglass tirelessly lobbied the government in Washington, urging Lincoln to emancipate the slaves. but the president still insisted the war was being fought for union and publicly avoided Douglas and the debate. Our Southern friend tell us the North is fighting for Negroes. Our union friend says they're not fighting to free the Negroes, but for the union. Very well. Let the whites fight for what they want. We Negroes fight for what we want. Liberty must take the day, nothing shorter. We care nothing about the Union. We've been in it slaves over 250 years. Whatever nation gets the control of the Ohio, Mississippi, and Missouri rivers will control the continent. William Tecumseh Sherman. Out West, Union naval strategy was straightforward. Seize control of the Mississippi and cut the Confederacy in two. On April 7th, Union gunboats and 2,000 troops took the Confederate fortress at Island Number 10 near New Madrid, Missouri, leaving the river open as far south as Memphis. Two months later, Memphis fell. On the night of April 24th, a 60-year-old flag officer, David G. Farragut, started north up the Mississippi, intent on capturing New Orleans. But first, he had to get by the heavy guns at Forts Jackson and St. Phillips, 70 miles below the city. When the moon rose, the Confederates opened fire and sent blazing rafts drifting into the Union fleet. The first vessel was hit 42 times. Farragut's own flagship was set on fire. But somehow, the entire fleet made it past the forts. New Orleans surrendered the next day. Farragut had the American flag raised over City Hall. New Orleans gone. And with it, the Confederacy? Are we not cut in two? That Mississippi ruins us if lost. Mary Chestnut. Tupelo, Mississippi. I don't know how the war will be decided if England and France don't interfere and stop the war, and if the Confederacy has to gain her independence by fighting. I am afraid she will have to give it up, for there are so few provisions in this portion of the Confederacy. James Jackson. In the following months, Farragut's fleet gained control of the southern Mississippi as far north as Baton Rouge and Natchez. But the north did not possess the whole river. 
the Confederate stronghold at Vicksburg still held.